here's a content creator for Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel that has officially quit the game. Not exactly the uh, biggest content creator or anything. It's a nice little VTuber here. But I thought it was very interesting to get this perspective uh, from someone that actually decided to dedicate time and effort into creating content for the game, actually starting up and building towards playing Yu-Gi-Oh! as a full-time... Uh, I don't know about full-time, but as a content creator, and then it's just like, just straight up, just I'm going to quit the game. So I'm curious to see what the uh, points made here are. I'm going to 1.25 this. Maybe 1.5 it. Right it here. Speaks Luna. Let's go ahead and talk about why I'm done streaming Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. Now, if you're new to my channel, oh, seven. let me go ahead and contextualize my oh, position seven. and where I'm coming from on this. Master Duel I wish was I had the bravery the to quit to ever happen to my YouTube channel and overall to my success as a live streamer and content creator. Okay, we I quintupled our sub numbers. That's guides, cool. And I leveraged the viewership and success of those guides in order to branch out into Jesus Christ. Platinum Dragon Maid guide. Platinum Striker guide. Bro, I've been making the wrong kind of content here. Why is it 55 minutes long? No one needs a 55 minute guide on how to summon Heratic Seal. What I really enjoy doing, which is the live stream. And I was able to make those guides because I have, at the very least, a competent level of knowledge about Yu-Gi-Oh! I played a lot of it back in 2014 at a level that at least saw me and my group of friends regularly attend locals and regional events for about a year or two. I quit the game. If you can play 2014 Yu-Gi-Oh! at like a competent level, you can probably jump into modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Because that's kind of where that old school, new school vibe kind of uh, starts off. And I was going to like actually make like a separate video on this thing, talking about how Yu-Gi-Oh! is like skill floor has like dramatically increased over the years and generations but 2014 specifically like that's probably where like old school new school like divide starts came at the time since the cost was high and my friends grew out of it only to find myself in 2022 upon master duels release making a guide for a deck that i genuinely enjoyed learning and playing which is sky strikers I so we're gonna have a red flag warning pop up because in a 28 minute video you can probably find that there's going to be red flags this right here this is a red flag, okay? We've given the benefit of the doubt, but that this is a red flag. I've been streaming Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel ever since for the better part of two years now, and I'm absolutely sick of it. So this video is not <laughs> only going to be a post-mortem and... I am absolutely sick of it. <laughs> ...an explanation to my community on why I'm no longer going to stream their favorite game, <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and spice it up a bit for anyone just peeping their head in and explain to you why I think Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel... Why does YouTubers move so much? Is this normal? Out there. To first explain why Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel sucks, we have to first <laughs> talk about the- <laughs> Okay, the bluntness I gotta appreciate. Here is why Master Duel sucks. Okay, alright. Which is, why does Yu-Gi-Oh! suck? And why Master Duel with- Oh, you can't show the Christian Urena Shangri-Ra game. No, you can All of its opportunity and potential to remedy it fails to do so. <laughs> now, again, I'm not turn. a casual level player. Like, pop him up over Look here. At Simply this trying to get a rise out of the community as someone with a casual level of experience with the game. I know how this game works. I play it a lot. And my brand of content largely revolves around playing Master Okay, so uh, admittedly, uh, some of the criticisms that get lodged at Yu-Gi-Oh generally come from like Yu-Gi boomers who are like, you know, the same old script as 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 always. Uh, wow, um, uh, card text too long. Um, uh, Yu-Gi uh, season zero very dark and evil. He is a psychopath. He is the average fo Florida man, etc. Right? Do you know what I mean? Like that's basically where ninety percent of Yu-Gi-Oh is like. YouTube content comes from in terms of the critiques of the game, but this is from someone who's actually actually really good at the game So it'll be interesting to see what they say about this Master Duel in at the very least a competent level Competent enough to be able to reach Master 1 with meta and rogue decks like Sky Strikers whenever I'd like So my grievances with the game is going to be coming from someone who has played it avidly for a good while now And only has a ton of reasons to continue to do so the first reason why I think Yu-Gi-Oh! is the worst card game out there is because of its <laughs> overabundance. Boy, he's so, like, I love the blood. <laughs> reason number one why Yu-Gi-Oh! is the worst card game. <laughs> of mechanics. Now, Yu-Gi-Oh! has a lot of mechanics. Yu-Gi-Oh! has 10 different summoning mechanics, 6 different special summoning mechanics, 10 different major card types, 9 different subtypes for spells and traps, 6 different abilities for monsters that pretty much act as subtypes for monsters, and then finally you have monster tokens and trap monsters that are treated differently from other monster types in the game, and even among the trap monsters. That further breaks down into two subtypes where you have cards like Shade Brigandine being a trap monster that is not treated as a trap, and Altergeist Emulatelf that has reminder text letting you know that it is still a trap. 
You can only imagine then how all of these different permutations and combinations of types and subtypes interact differently between Yu-Gi-Oh's six different turn phases and all of its open game states that lie in between. On top of all these super and subtypes of cards, there is a shameless bias for cards with more and more text that has only grown over the years. This creates a lot of bloat. For anyone who hasn't seen this graph, by the way, this is average words count of Yu-Gi-Oh card text by year. Uh, which is really crazy to see that even early Yu-Gi-Oh still had like 30 plus words on the card text. <laughs> like even early Yu-Gi-Oh, like early Yu-Gi-Oh still had like 30 plus cards, uh, 30 plus words on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of this stuff is like, it's a lot of information to take in. Now, admittedly, a lot of it is kind of fluff and a lot of it is like a lot that you'll never really need to know. Um, like you're never, if you jump into Yu-Gi-Oh today, you can probably get away with never learning what Gemini is. You can probably get away with never learning what Pendulum is, unironically. I, I don't say that to trash on Pendulum and pen players, but there are there is a genuine like pocket of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh players today who never learned what Pendulum something does and they never did. <laughs> so there is a lot of fluff, you know, like Union, you're probably never going to need to know that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but he's absolutely right. Like, in terms of, like, jumping into the game today, now where we are, like, the card text, the influx of um, just so much stuff there is, the learning curve, the skill floor, which maybe he'll touch on later, but the learning curve for Yu-Gi-Oh! is astronomical. Uh, I still, like, you know, don't know, like, certain rulings and certain, like, PSCT interactions, and I've played this game competitively for, like, nine years. Um, and I'll still, like, trip up and mess up how A into B or uh, A also does B, you know, mixes up. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's right. There is a lot of information. Four cards with more and more text that has only grown over the years. This creates a lot of bloat and complex interactions that absolutely everyone has run into problems with at least once in the past. Yes, everyone. Contrary to what you might think, this overabundance of mechanics is not only a new player problem, but it makes the game incredibly difficult to play and judge, even pro players, like Pack TCG, a two-time Yu-Gi-Oh! champion and consistent top placer at a Cheater! official Konami events was a- Ch Cheat- Cheeto! Someone find the clip. Someone find the clip real quick. Real quick. Real quick. Hang on, this is very important. This is very important. Where is it? Josh, I need this. Effect of uh, Turpin to special summon. And then Turpin's going to special summon to the field. Cheeto. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Anyway, let's continue. Accused of cheating by the Yu-Gi-Oh! community at a major Yu-Gi-Oh! event just <laughs> Go yesterday to clip. from the time I'm recording this for making a misplay that was only later caught by the official judges. Just think about that for a second. It wasn't just the pro players sitting across from each other who were unable to catch the misplay as it happened, but the official judges as well. The misplay, by the way, was illegal. Pack was issued a warning since it was caught late, which enough people were upset enough about to compel him to try and explain himself in a tweet. Whether or not he was cheating doesn't matter. I doubt he was since he has so much at stake if he were ever caught cheating. But if Yu-Gi-Oh! is too over convoluted for even the top level of pro players and judges to even the top level of pro players and judges to play play and judge properly, then it says a lot about the experience for everyone else further down the food chain. The bloat in Yu-Gi-Oh's mechanics often causes confusion, which in turn leads to a frustrating gameplay experience for many people, including me. Not only does Yu-Gi-Oh have too many mechanics, but it also has horrible card design that is a direct result of an abuse of power creep. For instance, trap cards are practically irrelevant in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. There's a really good video that explains this by Key Yu-Gi-Oh that I can refer you to, but basically because trap cards are cards That's that some react content used, right there. has been set for one turn on your turn, they are too slow. The only uh, uh, Chad, he's not wrong. Like some of you guys are like like you guys seem to always uh whenever someone makes a point, you like completely miss like the greater picture of the point being said. There was a time in Yu-Gi-Oh! where every single deck in the game would play like a powerful trap card. Combo decks would play like a copy of Mirror Force. Combo decks, like actual combo decks would play like Solemn Judgment or something. Like that was a period of time in Yu-Gi-Oh! Nowadays, you, no deck in the game plays trap cards. And before you say Infinite Impermanence, that's a very niche, unique type of card. Let's be real, that's a hand trap. It might as well just be a monster. Um, you can point to like, oh, Labyrinth or something like that. But understand that... The Labyrinth cards are the good cards there. 
in that in that deck. And on top of that, the good trap cards are searchable, which makes it significantly stronger. And on top of that, the best Labyrinth trap card is a Floodgate. <laughs> Dimensional Barrier. Um, so, yes, while a trap deck that is somewhat in the meta, it, not enough, by the way, it's had like one or two tops like per event this whole year. Um, what You can name one deck, but remember, the point is, is like there was a time in Yu-Gi-Oh, genuinely, where you would play trap cards even in non- uh, even in combo decks, because combo decks still took time to set up their combo. You still had to draw into your combo. You still had to get the right pieces together. Then you could like set up your thing. Trap cards are, for the most part, you would never really, as a as a as a random like just playing any deck in the game, you would never look at a good trap card and be like, okay, I'm gonna play this in my deck. Like Solemn Strike, for example. How many decks play Solemn Strike right now today? Uh, Labyrinth at an absolute stretch. Maybe we'll play Solemn Strike, right? A card like Solemn Strike like printed like 15 years ago would be stapled three of in every deck in the game do you know what i mean um so you know it's uh it is true anyway the trap cards you see being played are either archetype specific trap cards that do so much for that particular archetype or cards that literally change how trap cards work like infinite impermanence which is a trap card that negates monster effects and can be activated from your hand if you control no other cards on the field bypassing a trap card's restriction and thus its identity entirely and if it's not those trap oh, cards yeah, that's that being played really then the trap good, cards are likely only being used by specific archetypes like labyrinth or trap tricks who are designed with mechanics that explicitly enhance a trap card's performance labyrinth ku clock for example allows you to activate a normal trap card the turn it was set as opposed to waiting like, just think about the concept and the theme of Ku Clock. This card was printed and designed so that it could let you use traps on the turn they're set because that's how bad trap cards are. They had to, like, make cards that make the card, make trap cards, like, playable. Like, they had to design an entire archetype around trap cards being good because of how bad trap cards are. They had to build an archetype that searches trap cards and recycles trap cards and lets you use them from turn one in order for this deck to be playable, in order for this deck to be competitive and viable. And even then, you could argue that Labyrinth has not been the meta threat that it probably maybe should have been, right? Like, that's how bad trap cards are. Anyway, I don't know what really the point is to be fixating on this, is probably just to really sort of iterate just how fast and the speed of the game um, has developed, right? Waiting a turn, making it practically a spell card. And I wanted to start with this example, because trap cards being functionally outdated is a symptom of Yu-Gi-Oh's horrible card design, which comes from Konami's over-reliance and abuse of power creep in order to sell cards. The reason why trap cards are outdated is because modern Yu-Gi-Oh is too fast. There is no mana, like in Magic or Hearthstone, that limits your options. The only thing that limits your play in Yu-Gi-Oh are three Stop things. shaking. Yeah, I wish you would stop one normal summon, the quantity and quality of the cards in your hand, as well as the number of zones available on the field. All of these things are easily manageable and circumvented by modern Yu-Gi-Oh card design. Your one normal summon hardly dictates how many monsters that you can normal summon. There are so many cards in Yu-Gi-Oh that draws you more cards to supply you with quantity and either special summon search or dig for a specific card in your deck to make up for the quality. There are too many zones for it as a limitation to matter. Multiple monsters <laughs> combine with each other. There's too many zones, so what you need to do is get rid of them, Giga Chat. Into a single they should have printed Cash Dero with Diablosis and Master Duel. Do not at me. Uh, I will die on this hill. Go form with special summoning mechanics like Exceed Think summon, of the content. Vision summon, or Synchro Summoning in order to make powerful boss monsters that exist in an extra deck. A deck that exists entirely separate from the main deck that you draw from. This gives you full access to a suite of boss monsters that your deck, assuming it was built by anyone with a competent level of knowledge in this game, likely it is because you probably net decked your deck, should have no problem tapping into. This overall lack of limitation dilutes any sort of variance that is present in practically every other card game, and what it leads to are an overabundance of games that feel very similar to each other. Why would your matchup against a dominant archetype like Pirelli feel any different game by game if Pirelli has th This video deserves a dislike and a downvote just because he said Pirelli. Um, anyway, the um, biggest uh, cause of power creep that I've sort of managed to really notice over the years um, I think is generally been the link between the main deck, the extra deck, and back to the main deck. Now, what I mean by this is back in the day, quote unquote, yeah, sure, for come, get over here and lie down and take your pills. Back in the day, a combo deck wouldn't really interact that much with the main deck and then back to the main deck. De games, even with combo decks like Insectors, like Teledad, sometimes felt very different. You had like the general gameplay loop of like make like a level eight, for example, uh, in Teledad. But that level 8 you make doesn't get you in back into your main deck to do more stuff. So, 
an example of this, of power creep, is that when you have main deck starter cards that get you to extra deck monsters, that then get you more resources from your deck, what that does is that it creates a gameplay loop of every single game feeling very similar to one another. Kind of like how he's describing. So the variance and the fun in Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, is a very good point that I haven't really thought about that he's brought up just now, is kind of true. Games feel very similar today because you have combos that are very, like, linear um, that don't really have the same sort of... Uh, because, because of how consistent the decks are now, because of how fast the game is, the decks need to be consistent. And the best way to get um, consistency is the power creep of the card design, which is, here's a main deck starter card. This allows you to go into this Link 2 monster. This Link 2 monster then gets you this search from your main deck. And there are so many decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! that play in that exact same flow that there is no difference between a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! duels. A lot of duels feel so formulaic and feel so similar to one another. Um, you know, unlike something like a draft mode in Yu-Gi-Oh!, which I think is really great. And this is not to criticize Yu-Gi-Oh! as a game by itself. This is obviously just the current standard format that we have today of Yu-Gi-Oh!, which is cut, advanced, constructed, and for some reason, that seems to be the only best way to play it. If you play a game like Edison, you'll notice the difference. You can play a mirror match in Edison, you can play like a game in uh, a match in, in Edison, you can play a best of 10 in Edison, and every game feels really different. But if you play like a best of 10 in modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, they feel very similar. Um, and I suppose that's... Is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I don't know. What is draft? Uh, when you just pick like random cards out of a set card pool. Three cards that can search for 12 cards that can perform the same function of special summoning one of six monsters in your deck that either dig for those 12 cards or search for the three cards. And that this is exactly the loop he's describing. Yep. Yeah. I'll save you the trouble of parsing that confusing sentence. That is 21 cards in a maximum deck size of 40 that can pretty much search for itself, meaning over half the cards in a Pirelli deck is a super consistent engine of destruction that preys upon everything else. Ask anyone that plays card games at a somewhat competent level, and they will tell you the very same thing. This is ridiculous. Consistency is power, and consistency is king in card games. This leaves the only traces of variance for top-performing decks to be practically restricted behind the initial coin flip that determines who goes first, and who goes second, because whoever goes first is able to do their crazy combo setup, and whoever goes second has to respond. That all set, this doesn't leave hey, Drew Maxi off of Sleepy, by the way. technically, because this too is balanced by good old power creep, and goes back to why trap cards are outdated. A good deck will have enough interruption that can be played from the hand, or enough cards that totally invalidate the other player's turn. Ash Blossom will flat out stop effects that search or special summon from the deck. Kaijus are monsters that summon on your opponent's side of the field by tributing your opponent's monsters, completely bypassing any destruction or targeting immunity. Nibiru, the primal being, is a <laughs> meteor that can be summoned from the hand and obliterates the entire field on your opponent's turn if the opponent was dumb enough to play Yu-Gi-Oh! and perform five or more summons. Why would anyone wait a turn and rely on trap cards when these cards, ironically named as hand traps, are able to respond to and invalidate any board as soon as the game begins? Why wouldn't you play cards that invalidate your opponent's entire setup like Dark Ruler No More, a spell card that not only wipes all the card text and effects from your opponent's monsters, rendering them useless, but explicitly states that it cannot be responded to by the most conventional means? Because of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s card design. It's wild that a card like Dark Ruler had to be printed and it's like not even like you know, a staple, like, three-of card in, like, every side deck, which is, like, hilarious to me. I just, like, uh, you read Dark Ruler no more, and you think to yourself, like, this is the most broken card ever printed, and it's, like, not even, like, a staple. It's, like, that's how good the decks are. Design. A lot of its gameplay loops thus feel very binary. Did you win the coin flip or not? Did you open your combo play or not? Did you open enough interruption or cards that invalidate your opponent's turn or not? And all of this is decided within the first couple turns of the game, meaning nobody has time to set trap cards and play them, and also that there are very rarely any complex board states. Why would there be any sort of complexity when there are so many cards like Evenly Matched and Dark Ruler No More which have the potential to pacify the opponent's entire board? Yu-Gi-Oh!'s card design dictates the pacing of the game, with its lack of resource mechanics, its reliance of convoluted effects, and the abundance of solutions that reduce monsters and entire boards to paperweights and dust. It places so much <laughs> emphasis and importance within the first couple of turns. You're never plotting out damage over a sequence of turns, and you're never setting up an elaborate plan over any sort of duration. There is no point in thinking about turns four and on when everything that matters is right in front of you. This means there is no sense of tempo. There are no in-game Oh my god, all the... No 
long -term toast strategy. Everything happens at a breakneck pace, and so many things are inherently unfair by being uninteractable, which reduces the number of meaningful decisions you make in a game. The final thing I will say that bothers me the most about Yu-Gi-Oh is its lack of flavor. And I know that sounds weird. The uh, the main uh, takeaway, really, I think, from that body of arguments there is pretty much just like the speed of the game, right? And because the game is so fast and so consistent, um, the combos are all very similar as e uh, to one another. And because of that, every game feels very formulaic and similar. So I, can, uh, I, I respect and understand the uh, criticisms here, and it's not for everyone. And I guess that's obviously why he quit. Um, why is Yu-Gi-Oh not Hearthstone? Yeah, well, I mean, listen, you could argue that, like, why is uh, card game different from other card game? But, you know, for clearly a lot of people, and if it was untrue, they would they would be playing Yu-Gi-Oh, otherwise they wouldn't be playing other card games. That is a massive uh, drawback of the game. Because here's the thing, people don't uh, need to remember, Yu-Gi-Oh has the potential to feel very uh, not formulaic, very different. Uh, every game has the potential to feel, like, unique in that way. And the biggest proof of that is you just play any old-school format. Uh, I've played so much GOAT format. A couple years ago, I was just, like, had this GOAT phase. I've played so much GOAT format. And every game feels very different. Every set card that they have could be a bluff. It could be a good knock target. The top decks are different. The cards they draw are unique. Uh, there's no real setup of main combos and stuff like that because every board state and every game it looks very different to one another because the way you draw your cards is different at any one time compared to modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Whereas all the cards that you want, you can usually access immediately. Turn one if you've opened the right two, three card combo, etc. Which is very possible because you have 12 starters and five, ext eh, five that's an understatement, like 10 extenders and... 10 defensive cards to stop your opponent from doing their combo, you know, so that's like the main criticism is that um, he finds it very formulaic, uh, which is, you know, a very uh, reasonable way to look at the game. Weird if you don't come from card games, but let me explain. In Magic the Gathering, you, the player, are a planeswalker, an entity that Yet can travel between walker, separate Harry. universes with ease. You tap into naturally occurring ley lines that produce magical energy in the form of mana in order to cast spells and basically conduct wizard battle with your nerdy friends. The spells you cast come from a mental library, which in-game is your deck of cards. This explains why every card, other than lands, in Magic is considered a spell and thus can be counterspelled. Even creature cards are spells that summon creatures into battle. This background provides a lot of context to the thematic design of cards. Thoughtseize is a card that discards any card from your opponent's hand, but thematically, you are reading the conscious mind of the enemy player and stealing their thoughts away. I don't know what, like, uh, small I don't know where we're going with life, this take. So he's typed as a food golem. Given his size, he has small stats and has haste, expressing his ability to fit into tight spaces and move quickly. And when you're done using him, you can activate its third ability, which says to sacrifice Ginger Brew in order to give you three life, which implies that you ate him. This continues in <laughs> Sir Ginger, who can also be eaten. Okay. Dragons, barring exceptions, all have flying in their card text and usually have a 4 4 or 5 5 stat line. And if they don't have those things, often they will have something thematic to explain it. This kind of flavor exists in abundance in Magic and many other card games. It's very clear that it is a conscious design decision, and it basically doesn't exist in Yu Gi Oh! Yu Gi Oh! is. Okay, that is uh, definitely not true. Uh, Yu Gi Oh! archetypes are actually very cool at. Um, playing in the way that they are thematically supposed to be uh, represented, right? A good example of this that I was, uh, you know, told by um, once upon a time is uh, dangers are a very good, cool aspect of taking a theme and making it mechanics, right? And there's a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh uh, archetypes and decks that work mechanically how they're themed. Um, for example, like the danger monsters, they are, you know, they're, there's a lot of these like mythological creatures that have never been seen before, like the Bigfoot, etc., etc., right? So you reveal a danger from your hand, it comes out and it shows itself and then it hides again. And then your opponent has to pick a card from your hand, right? That's a very basic, simple example of how like the dangers work and theme to um, what they're based off of lore wise, etc., etc. Let's et go. Uh, at Emancipator, excavates cards from the top of your deck. It's a deck of little miners. And the mi that came out wrong. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Mining as in, like, the uh, the profession of, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> woo! That, uh, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was a sentence. They mine things 
right? So they work in the mines and they excavate rocks and precious gems and you excavate five and then you special summon a gem, right? Like that's, that's like the theme. So there is a thousand examples of this in Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm sure uh, I, I could think about more if I sat and really thought about it. But anyway, uh, that's just a simply untrue, Jesus like what he's saying right now. That is, that is just not true. Yu-Gi-Oh has plenty of examples of cards that work based off of their lore and theme. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> excavate rocks and now I have an Apollosa. Why is Alibur a dragon? I don't know what this take is. I don't know anything about branded lore. Um, that applies to Runic as well. Every time I see a, a fountain, I know I'm in danger. That's that's terminally online. Uh, that is a terminally online take. Dream? Shut up! <laughs> Almost purely mechanical and complex. Dyer gifted a Why sub to can dream. Kestira Fenrir search for any Kestira <laughs> Dyer monster, isn't sub to herself, but gifted a sub to dream. Okay. cards are unable to do. What about E purely happiness tells you that it is more adept at fetching any sort of Purelli card from your deck after attacking, or that it can have the attack of a monster on the field after doing so? Why can Bishul Magnumut can search for any dragon monster and none of his sibling cards can? Flavor isn't totally non-existent in Yu-Gi-Oh, of course, and magic isn't without stale cards. But in Yu-Gi-Oh, flavor is clearly playing third or fourth fiddle. And it makes sense why. Yu-Gi-Oh is played with a group. I mean, I suppose to some extent in Yu-Gi-Oh, you don't notice the, 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 the theme of uh, a lot of the cards and stuff like that because of like the pace of the game. There isn't really time to sort of appreciate it. But 100% Yu-Gi-Oh has like plenty of cards that work thematically exactly how they are mechanically built and uh, mechanically designed. Gross amount of power creep. Good cards need to do a lot of things. And how can you express all this card text succinctly in just one art piece? Magic the Gathering cards, in contrast, can remain relatively simple in design because power creep isn't nearly as present thanks to its standard rotating format. A simple design is more easily conveyed through a single art piece, and thus magic generally... At this point, it really is just kind of boiling down to I prefer magic because it's slower and power creep isn't as prevalent because there's rotation, which is fair. Um, but I don't think that makes it somehow objectively better than Yu-Gi-Oh, right? But of, of course, I don't think he's going to be suggesting that this is objective, right? I mean, this is just one person's opinion. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, there's no power creep. About it. Okay, well, like, in the extent that there's, you know, it's controllable in theory. Uh, of Hearthstone, like, I've seen the power creep over years. Like, some of the, you read some of the modern Hearthstone so cards, you're like, how is this thing ever created? Uh, I remember I read Ultimate Infestation for the first time a few years ago. That was the funniest experience ever. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, the point is, is like with a rotation format that's like controllable in Yu-Gi-Oh, there's like no control over that. Do you know what I mean? It really has much more powerfully Which is fine. Form. Like, you know, if you prefer like entire formats just being totally rotated out, that's okay. But in Yu-Gi-Oh, it's going to be... Um, that's one of the bad things about Yu-Gi-Oh per se that I think... Um, I think something like a rotating format would be really good for the game, or at the very least, alternative formats. When and all of the different shapes and flavors we've expressed before, draft, uh, legacy mode, um, blah 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 blah. There's like a million different ways to make Yu-Gi-Oh fun outside of the current constructed standard format. Um, so it's the biggest downfall and pitfall of the game is that Yu-Gi-Oh has one way and one way to play only. If there isn't any other way to play, uh, cry about it. Although to be fair, Time Wizard is getting a little bit popular now. All of this is why I think Yu-Gi-Oh sucks. Now, <laughs> clearly everything here and everything Jesus else I'm about to say is based purely on preference and my opinion. Poop, 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 poop. I mean, what else would it be? Everyone Thank who you, continues Tungus. to play the game clearly doesn't place as much importance or stock on these things as I do, and that's completely fine. I am only explaining my position and why I favor other card games vastly more than Yu-Gi-Oh. Magic the Gathering has powerful and succinct expression in its cards, and I like the pacing of its limited formats. Lorcana has great original art and turns the competitive team Hey, bro, there's no shot you're gonna come here and tell me that Donald Duck Attack for Game has more fucking theme and flavor than Yu-Gi-Oh, okay? Ain't no shot I'm taking, like, lore and, uh, you know, thematic uh, standards of cool cards when some little bro is gonna tell me, like, yeah, Mickey Mouse effect, special summon fucking Donald, Dr uh, Donald Trump, Donald Duck, okay? Sh shut the fuck up, all right? TCG paradigm on its head by making a resource building game as opposed to a game that is focused on destroying the other player. Flesh and Blood is slowly overtaking all of them in my list of preference thanks to its flavorful card and game design, which revolves entirely around fantasy RPG classes and their equipment. I can go. I wish Yu Gi Oh cards had space for flavor text, honestly. It would be so cool. It is what it is. What can, you know, the problem is Yu Gi Oh, fun, fun fact, you know, like per like square meter, square centimeter on a card, Yu Gi Oh has like the smallest space for card text. Like the box, like the area which you write the text in Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh has the smallest like area of space for any card game, but it has the most text required to explain cards in any card game.
It's like such a paradox. So you're never going to have any space for like flavor text. Vanilla monster? Yeah, great. Yeah, sure. Those cards are viable. Check this out. Go on and on about how other <coughs> card games are so much better in my opinion, but I'll save it for another video. Let's go ahead and instead talk about why Master Duel is the worst digital card game out there and why I will no longer stream it. Despite Yu-Gi-Oh's vast card pool and its Okay, hold. Successful community-driven formats, Master Duel has no accommodations for playing any desirable alternate game modes. Why I say desirable is because there are technically alternate formats, but nobody plays them. And there is no matchmaking for these formats outside of Team Battle, which, you guessed it, nobody plays. Now that that's out of the way, what about the- Every time I've tried to log into Team Battle on Master Duel, it's my Twitch chat stream sniping me. It's really funny. Either the queue times out and it says no opponents found, or I just get stream sniped. Community formats. Well, the most successful community formats by far include Edison and Goat. Edison and Goat formats are what is known as Time Wizard formats, meaning that they represent a format that existed sometime in Yu-Gi-Oh's rich history, including what cards were available to them at the time, how those- Look at this, like, massive potential and this huge, just, array of different game- Like, you play, you know, um, what's a deck that I really like from this kind of era? Like, frog format, you know, barring the actual FTK, there was, like, a lot of, like, fun decks here. Um, and, like, you play that, and you play, like, 2020, like, 19 or onwards, and it's, like, it's a different game. Like, you are not playing the same card game. Like, you play, like, Airblade 2006 Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, you're playing, like, Checkers, and then you play, like, Salomon Great today, and it's just, like, you're playing Call of Duty. It's a different fucking game. Completely different games. Um, and that's the sad thing is like people don't get to experience these old school formats. Even like the dumb ones you'd think like are terrible, like Dino Rabbit. There would probably be enough people who enjoyed it if Konami was to like create some sort of like tavern brawl system in Master Duel, where every week there would be like rotating like legacy formats that you can just jump in and play. You know, that would be so fun if there was like a dedicated rank time wizard edison ladder or there would be like you know weekly festivals or something but it would be like rotating between like oh this week we're gonna play 2007 this week we're gonna play 2015 this week we're gonna play 2002 like that would just like people would love master dope and it would be for all kinds of different players and people um to try that but yeah to be fair the best suggestion is literally anything would be cool because <laughs> you know master dope just has not really put in the time and effort to try and do something like that not even close cards worked and which cards were forbidden or limited. Goat format represents Yu-Gi-Oh! in April of 2005 and Edison represents Yu-Gi-Oh! in March of 2010. Edison is so popular that it was suggested to Raran, a Hearthstone content creator who originally wanted to give 10 hours and learn Yu-Gi-Oh! with Masadol, then got so frustrated with the game that he quits early after 4. But what's the problem? Well, listen, okay, Raran, to be fair, does a lot of uh, things to himself here when it comes to, you know, the old uh, spindle bike wheel being a uh self uh you know guy falls over his own bike you know like uh, raran did a little bit of that but you know uh to be fair he tried edison he didn't even like it so if edison is so good like, he just straight up just fundamentally didn't enjoy Yu-Gi-Oh, which is fair a lot of people are going to experience that then only represents a previous format in Yu-Gi-Oh's history why doesn't the community just play edison in master duel after all master duel has all of the cards that edison format uses since it's just using an older card pool except the shit well the problem is that Edison and Goat format literally cannot be played in Master Duel. Edison and Goat format play with old Yu-Gi-Oh rules, which are significantly different to the rules of modern day Yu-Gi-Oh. As well, several key cards have been officially reworded and nerfed from since then. Since Master Duel cannot- To be fair, the Sangan Arata will never come up in Goat format. Be customized in any which way regarding ban lists, rule changes, rulings, or nerfs, it's not only impractical okay, this to card play those formats up. given the rarities of certain cards, but it is flat out impossible. Not only can you not play it any will. desirable... How is not being able to use the monster immediately with Sangan ever going to really matter in, mass in, in GOAT format? Like, when has that ever actually came up? Shut up, chat. ...alternate game modes, but there's no effort from Konami to give you alternate formats to play. The only alternate formats that players can widely play are limited time events, and Can't only a few of them Sash. are really successful. They exist mostly as a means for the player base to farm currency, as opposed to being something that was thoughtfully designed for players to have fun thinking about the game in a different way. Given how limited the time frame is to enjoy these alternate game modes and how inconsistent they are in terms of quality and fun, I think it is a total failing on Konami's part that the only way we can interact with Yu-Gi-Oh's rich and diverse card pool is through its horrible current standard format. 
I mean, that's like the biggest fundamental takeaway, right? It's like, if you don't like current Yu-Gi-Oh, you're going to hate Master Duel, you're going to hate the TCG, you're going to hate OCG, it doesn't matter what you do, right? If you don't like the way the current game is, uh, you're just going to have a bad time. Despite the fact that Yu-Gi-Oh has literally created multiple amazing, fun, enjoyable formats throughout its rich history and legacy, but there's no way to really enjoy it, at least in any sort of like official capacity, right? You have to like beg your local OTS store to maybe run an Edison format. I can promise you like most OTSs don't do that. You have to like um, maybe go to an event at like a YCS to sign up for like the one singular like Edison tournament that uh, that is going on, et cetera, et cetera. Like there isn't like a consistent way. And online, by the way, just doesn't exist unless... <laughs> Well, German train industry really is just developing stonks and marketing if anyone wants to. Anyway, um, but yeah, that, that just doesn't like exist, you know? And we can't get away from talking about the elephant in the room, and that is Max C. Max C is by far the most <laughs> poorly designed card to exist. Ah, so this is what we were building up to this whole time in this reaction video. Maxi bad! Ah, I see! The only thing you need to know about Maxi is in its effect, which reads, during either player's turn, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard. This turn, each time your opponent special summons a single or multiple monsters, immediately draw one card. You can only use one Maxi per turn. This one card, which has existed throughout the entirety of Master Duel, single-handedly ruins the entire game, and its presence <laughs> is felt in every single game. If you don't understand, let me explain. Max C punishes your opponent for playing Yu-Gi-Oh. We've already gone over how fast Yu-Gi-Oh is and how everything is determined within the first two turns. Almost any competent deck... Yeah, well, you see, buddy, if I activate Max C, you're not going to be able to do all of this crazy first turn crazy combo, huh? Yeah, exactly. I am very intelligent is going to special summon a lot, whether to set up a death maze on turn one or to handle the death maze on turn two. This one card, therefore, is a counter to almost every playable deck in Yu-Gi-Oh! And the decks that aren't countered by this card were either eviscerated by Konami with their ban list or are too slow or not nearly as consistent as the premier meta decks. How is it? Hot take, Monarch still loses to Maxi. Hot take, Monarch still loses to Maxi so effective. All you do is draw cards. Well, I'll refer you to this video, but let me go ahead and quickly explain myself. In a game where there's no mana and virtually nothing to limit your play other than the quantity you and get one draw of cards in your hand. Exactly. That's the funny thing. That is the funny thing. In an absolute worst case scenario, minimum value for maxi, you get a draw. Worst case scenario, it cycles your deck for one. That is so busted that absurd it is ridiculous hand, Maxi provides an overwhelming advantage to its player. You don't need quality cards if you have enough of them. Even drawing one or two cards in a game of Yu-Gi-Oh, where so many cards search, draw, and dig for other cards in your deck, is enough to give its I player I remember giving five cards advantage. to Monarchs, Maxi seeing me, and they still break. exist strategies <laughs> okay, to counter Maxi. They are not nearly as consistent, nor are they as effective enough as this one card. You can disagree, but you're wrong. A whopping 93% <laughs> of decks have max C in their Giga deck, Jad. and 98 times out of 100 at max 3 copies. The other card that I have in the image is Ash Blossom, which is the second most played card because it is, among other things, max C's direct counter. Because Maxi is so powerful, it generalizes deck building. Almost every deck has to pay the Maxi tax by including at least three copies of max C and three copies of Ash Blossom in their build, with other counter cards as a consideration. This will likely never change, given that these cards are max rarity cards in Master Duel, and thus it is a tax that practically all players will pay with their precious points that they use to craft cards, which obviously translates to revenue for Konami. On top of this, Eastern players whoa, are largely tolerant and- Whoa, 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 hold on. Do we think that Maxi not being banned in Master Duel is a revenue thing? Because it's been around in OCG for years, and that's not a revenue thing, right? I don't know if that's like, I don't know if I would really say that that's based on money. I don't know if that's true. Um, what do you mean pay? What is he talking about? Well, you have to, when you play Ma Master Duel, you craft Maxi, and Maxi costs you 90 UR, which you will have to do if you want to play uh, Master Duel even semi-seriously. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, that is a tax that you get from your gems that you earn, right? And? I mean... Do you think a card printed in 2011 should be that monumental and pivotal in a card game in 2023? Like, and Giga Chad, I guess, but do you really think, like, listen, I'm not trying to sidetrack this discussion into, like, maxi good or bad, but do you think in principle it's right for a 12-year-old card that is literally capable of entering, like, is too old to enter Dragon Duels at this point almost, is, um, should be such a fundamental pivotal role in a game? Like, you think a card from that, that long ago should be that influential? I don't know. That just doesn't seem right to me. 
supportive of Maxi's inclusion in the game. As it you has have to been craft cards to play the game. There. No, the, 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 oh my god, people are just missing the point here. It's not, I'm getting one guy. It's not about you have to craft card to play game. It's that you have to craft this specific card to have a, to, to, to play any deck in the game. To just, it's, it's entering the arena. You have to, instead of like going to like a concert and you hand in a ticket, you know, the ticket you hand in is three copies of Maxi. That's how you play Yu-Gi-Oh! In 2023, you have to play Maxi, you know? A anyway, we're not doing this. No, you don't join the 7%. True! Exclusive physical format, the OCG, which is separate from the Universal Master Duel format Get and the streamer. Western Player's physical TCG format. Given how <coughs> necessary Maxi is to all players and its support from the player base that Konami has a bias towards, Maxi will very likely never be banned in Master Duel. And remember how I said how Yu-Gi-Oh! feels so binary? Well, Master Duel is worse because of Maxi. Now, on top of the coin flip minigame that you so desperately want to win in a best of one format, you also have a huge portion of all of your games practically invalidated by this single card. Whether it's you using Maxi on your opponent and reaping an instant win, or your opponent unleashing it upon you, absolutely nobody is having fun. I can go on and on about- Wrong! 7% of the player base are having fun because they don't play it. A master duel being bad. Not just for me, but for casual players as well casual match is a joke the fact that i can't set up a team battle in the lobby to have fun with friends is ridiculous bro the duel room is like so badly functional like i can't believe they haven't iterated upon this in like two years almost like the fact that you can't set up like in-game tournaments and stuff is like really sad not being able to implement a custom ban list for a lobby is dumb and the fact that i can't enable a best of three op custom ban list would be insane option with side decking in a lobby is so mind-numbingly stupid and it's all indicative of what I hate the most about Master Duel, which is Konami's cold and utterly detached relationship it shares with the Western community. The community cannot hold Konami accountable to anything. It has only shown indifference in the face of any complaints. Because Yu-Gi-Oh! is so wildly different than any other card game and has a strong brand identity with its anime, Konami has no reasonable fear that its player base may dramatically change from poaching or as a consequence from their decisions. In fact, major decisions from their perspective only pose a risk to lose players. Banning Maxi may please a lot of Western players, but how many new players will it create? How many Eastern players will they lose as a result of this decision? The trade-off is obvious. There is no reason for Konami to make any major changes when they are the sole kingpin that holds this specific brand of cardboard crack that its player base <laughs> is so fervently loyal to. Konami... You know that's probably like the best argument for Maxi is um, pretty much like the people who continue to play Yu-Gi-Oh! will play Yu-Gi-Oh! irrespective of Maxi and the people who like Maxi, you risk losing as like a portion of your player base because... Banning Maxi means that they don't want to play the game anymore, right? Whereas, like, Maxi existing is already, like, sort of preaching to the choir. Because it's been around for so long that if you still have a growing audience in OCG, then chances are, you know, you could, you could risk that fundamental, amazing, money-making, revenue-generating formula that you have over there. And if you make such a drastic change like this, you risk losing that. But at the same time, you could definitely argue, what if... How many players could you potentially create and bring back to the game if you ban Maxi? Has no ambition to make Yu-Gi-Oh! appeal to a wider market because they know it's a horribly convoluted mess that's hard to teach, hard to watch, and that's literally why they made Rush Duel. Certain marketing moves, like their recent deck flexing series, gives me some hope for the future of the game, but the fact that it took a better part of two years for Konami to realize that Master Duel has the potential to appeal to a wider audience, Pulls and up, that chat. it might be a really good idea for them to leverage their loyal and successful indie content creators to do that, it tells me that Konami is too slow to adapt, and that I can just go ahead and do myself a big favor of not playing the game until they decide to improve it, and so that's what I'll do. <laughs> As a content creator, Master Duel was absolutely my biggest break. I've met one of my closest friends in this space strictly because of Master Duel. Every time I turn on a Master Duel stream at my regular time, I can reasonably expect anywhere between 60 to 150 people to hop in. I'm not sure if many people can relate to how gratifying it feels for someone like me, an indie content creator that loves streaming, to have that expectation be met on a consistent basis. The point is, I stand to lose a lot. You could argue that I would service myself a lot better if I could just stop my feelings of the game from affecting my desire to make content. But I can't. The reality is that I hate this game. And I hate <laughs> more that I've convinced myself for so long that it's the only avenue that I have as a content creator. I've made guides for other games before that did very well, and I can do it again. I have made entertaining live stream content and shorts on this channel that did well, and I can do it again. It doesn't have to be for a game like Master Duel, and least of all does it have to be for a game that I actively hate. And if I can't do it again, then I would rather hang it up and call it quits. 
I'm done with lying to myself, and I'm done with streaming Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. To my viewers and supporters, you know oh, how it is. That's and fair. You, it's me. I am very appreciative of all the people that decided to follow, subscribe, join. I, like, that's, in the end, like, you can't, like, you know, there's nothing to argue against that. Like, he just doesn't like the game. You know? That's, it is what it is. Oh, wow, you guys are really intelligent, by the way. We put a poll up here for Maxi, and 75% of you think it's bad. This shit used to always be 50-50. I'm glad after almost two years that you guys have recognized uh, that this card is actually bad and toxic. Great. Awesome. On my Discord. And whore hop. Bro has 60 viewers talking like he's donkey quitting league. The... Bro, dude, it's a personal take here, okay? It's about perspective. Just because he doesn't have, like, billions of viewers in the full-time content creator doesn't mean, like, their opinion isn't valid. You know, like obviously this would be like a bigger deal if it was like a, you know, a huge content creator that was quitting the game and stuff like that. Uh, you were one of them, idiot. No, I wasn't. Maxi was always bad for the game. Liar. The context of Yu-Gi-Oh. Like the opinion here is still very valid and real, you know. I'm grateful to have met all the people that I did Before meet while interacting in the space. I hope that I can I was indifferent. To interact and work with them. Not an apologist. That's, that's the key together term. In the future. I suspect that for a lot of those people that this is where we will have to part ways. But if you are still interested in keeping up with this me, up a little bit I'm here. going to be happily pursuing long-form streaming on both YouTube and Twitch. So subscribe to this channel and follow me on there. I'm going to be exploring other strategy and card games similar to Yu-Gi-Oh! and find out where I best fit. So far, I've been really enjoying Backpack Battles. Hearthstone is coming up with its own tag duel game mode in two-player battlegrounds. Marvel Snap is something I've been wanting to hop back into. Pokemon TCG might be worth looking into. Warcraft Rumble is a new game I just started playing. Honestly, that it's cool really that he's willing to try and new Fight things. And is coming out with a new set, and it's looking to be very to him, like There's a lot of different possibilities. If Master Duel does receive any major changes, like banning Maxi or putting Engage at 3, maybe if they add the link. <laughs> I will come back to Master Duel if they put Engage to 3. <laughs> New <laughs> card. Uh. All right, well, put it in your calendar, guys. Um, red news coming back to the game as soon as that end gauge goes to three. Uh, I might check it out. Uh, that's fine, right? If there's new stuff to do, there's new content, it's fun. Uh, I can definitely see myself coming back and streaming it again. But as far as that goes, I don't think it'll ever wipe away my feelings. All we need is Maxi and Crossout and Yu-Gi-Oh! is fixed. How much this I is photoshopped really like the gameplay loop. This is uh, not real. This is, this is photoshopped. For my channel, right? Uh, I, I that's not real. But... I feel like Yu-Gi-Oh! and sticking with just Yu-Gi-Oh! has put me more in a box than anything. And I, I need to put this out there because I don't want to do... I don't want to be in the box. <laughs> I don't want to be in the box anymore. I'm, yeah, that's pretty much it. So yeah, if this is where we part ways, you know, hey, I understand. Uh All right, anyway, uh, that was a um, eye-opening video, especially from uh, a content creator who was, I guess, for the better part of the last, like, year or so making exclusively Yu-Gi-Oh! videos uh, and Yu-Gi-Oh! content live on stream. Um, I think that there was a lot of valid um, things that were brought up. Uh, the main thing, realistically, like, I feel like we've done this conversation to death now, is that there's a lack of um, alternative ways to play Yu-Gi-Oh! as a game, when Yu-Gi-Oh! as a game has just an incredible amount of uh, rich history, uh, different old school formats that are definitely super enjoyable uh, and super fun. Um, but there's just no way to really enjoy and explore that too much in this modern age, unfortunately. Uh, and that's a big tragedy of Yu-Gi-Oh! Is that it's just not appealing to um, anyone outside of current constructed advanced format.